In 1453, the great city of Constantinople, the heart of the Byzantine Empire, which had lasted for more than a thousand years, fell to the Turks after a lengthy siege. As a symbol of what had happened, the Christian Church of St. Sophia was transformed into a Muslim mosque, which still dominates the modern city of Istanbul. Europe itself was threatened by the Turks. The Balkans were overrun, and the Mediterranean was dominated by their navy. In 1526, the King of Hungary was killed, and his army blasted to pieces in the Battle of Mohacz. In 1529, Vienna itself was besieged, an experience which was repeated in 1688. By that time, the Turkish Empire almost surrounded the Mediterranean. In the middle of the 15th century, when the Turks were so dominant, no one could have guessed that Europe, this besieged quarter continent, would eventually come to dominate the globe. But 300 years later, Europe's naval and military power reached out past the East African coast to the Indian Ocean and on to Southeast Asia. Why did this happen? How did it come about? What was the motor that drove Europe on? Medieval Italy was the cradle of European power. At San Gimignano in Tuscany, the medieval towers still stand as a reminder of the power of the independent city-states. It was here, in these tiny, ornate states, during the 12th and 13th centuries, that modern finance was born. There were many city-states in northern Italy. Florence, Genoa and Venice were among the most important. Venice had a trading network that extended all over the known world. Its maritime traditions are still reflected in the annual boat race round the island in the lagoon on which the city is built. Venetian commercial successes led to the Rialto in Venice becoming one of the world's first international banking centres. Genoa, its maritime rival, also became a powerful centre of financial interests and Venice and Genoa financed virtually all European trade with Asia and India. The financial and military power of the Italian city-states was based on their trading relations with each other and with the East, and it stimulated political and cultural development throughout northern Italy. In Tuscany, city-states such as Florence became both powerful and inventive. It was in Florence in the 14th and 15th centuries that the techniques of modern industry were developed. This was part of the Renaissance in Italy, a stupendous outburst of artistic and cultural creativity which led to a revolution in human understanding of nature and society. Architecture flourished under the patronage of rich and powerful nobles. A moral revolution resulted in popes such as Alexander VI, the Borgia Pope, with his string of illegitimate children. He treated the Triple Crown as a mere token of secular power. 
During and after the Renaissance, art was no longer dominated by religious dogma, and artists began to look at the world with new eyes. They painted what they saw about them, and observed detail, texture and light with new precision. Even religious motifs were often interpreted in a humanistic manner. The artistic revolution began a revolution in perception. Perspective was mastered and manipulated. Masaccio and Piero della Francesca organized objects around a vanishing point. The rebirth of interest in Greece and Rome meant that for many hundreds of years in Europe, the learning of classical languages was to be the touchstone of an educated man. Renaissance scholars rediscovered and re-edited classical texts, but they also looked to the future. The Italian genius Leonardo da Vinci developed and designed machines to help men to fly. also sketched many hundreds of engineering and mechanical devices. He experimented with new pigments and techniques of painting. The invention of printing by Johann Gutenberg in 1453 spurred on the revolution in thought. Individually crafted letters held in racks or trays made it possible to mass-produce pamphlets, polemics, and religious books. Up to 50,000 individual pieces of type could be used in producing a single book. The Gutenberg system of printing survived until the 19th century, and many of its early products were outstanding. Gutenberg's first Bible was printed in Gothic script, in Latin, hand-decorated, and a book of great beauty. Within 50 years of Gutenberg starting to work, secular texts in many languages were widely available. This book in Spanish was printed in 1515. This in Hebrew was printed in Naples in 1487. Also, the hand-decorated Cologne Bible of 1478 was printed in Low German so that anyone literate could read it. Religious knowledge was no longer the prerogative of a privileged and educated elite. Greece and Italy had been at the center of European power for more than a thousand years. It was Italy that initiated the transformation of Europe in the late Middle Ages. But after the Renaissance, the eastern end of the Mediterranean went into a decline and lost its supremacy to Spain. King Charles V of Spain inherited huge lands in Austria, the Netherlands and Italy. He was also the Holy Roman Emperor. After his abdication in 1556, the balance of European power had shifted decisively to the north. Monarchs like Queen Elizabeth I of England began to rival imperial power, and the Spanish Armada was decisively defeated in 1588. Before this period, northwestern Europe had been altogether barbarous. In Holland, rival gangs of hooligans, the hooks and cable jaws, dominated what passed for politics. In the Baltic, savages appeared from time to time to battle meaninglessly with each other. And in Scotland and northern England, Civilization consisted of protection rackets operated by half-savage marcher lords. During the 16th and 17th centuries, this situation was transformed. Northwestern Europe became the dominant power in world history for the next three centuries. The decline of the Mediterranean world was a gradual one, and many factors played a part. 
Italy in particular was badly affected by plague in 1599, 1602 and in 1630. Perhaps a third of the population in towns such as Venice and Milan died in this way. Also, the decline of the Mediterranean world was caused by an agricultural crisis and explosive increases in population. In 1500, the European population was 69 million, and by 1800, it had grown to 188 million. Before about 1500, most peasant farmers in Europe barely managed to produce enough to feed themselves, their cattle, and to provide seeds for the next sowing. A single year's crop failure would inevitably lead to famine. But at the beginning of the 16th century, an agricultural revolution occurred. In the Netherlands, the scientific rotation of crops was combined with other new techniques of arable farming. The increase in yields was stupendous. This led to new methods of managing livestock. It now became possible to maintain large stocks of cattle through the winter. Farmers were able to accumulate enough fodder to feed the cattle and to keep them in pens away from the worst of the weather. New plants were introduced, like the potato, and better strains of known plants, like the turnip and onion. Turnip Townsend, in Great Britain in the 18th century, and Jethro Tull made a great name for themselves by spreading and developing the new Dutch techniques. It was in this way that Northwest Europe came eventually to avoid the crippling famines, which had distinguished all other civilizations in the past. In the Mediterranean, famine caused high prices and high wages. Food had to be imported and grain was transported from the Ukraine and eastern Poland in Dutch merchant ships past the Sound where the Danes levied a toll. The extent of this trade grew and grew. By 1600 there was a very steady flow of grain to Spain and Italy and in return money to Amsterdam and the Northwest. Amsterdam became the hub of the world's trade and pioneered a wide variety of technologies. A vast range of specialized industries grew up, such as the cutting and polishing of raw diamonds from India. Dutch industrial and political development stimulated similar developments in England. The arrival of the Dutch king, William III, on the English throne in 1689 was rapidly followed by the establishment of the Bank of England, which was built up with Dutch money and techniques. By the early 18th century, the Royal Exchange was financing trade and even industry. London became the metropolis of Western Europe, and London's docks became as crowded as those of Amsterdam, with the produce of the world. The economic transformation of Europe went together with political and military upheavals. The Dutch clashed with their Catholic Spanish masters in 1581 to proclaim something truly revolutionary in Europe, the deposition of their king, Philip II. They also revolutionized military thinking. A Dutch general of the 1590s, Maurice of Nassau, printed the first military training manuals in European history to show the soldiers how to use their muskets. One file of men fired, another reloaded, and pikemen were in the third row to fend off cavalry charges. These attempts to bring order to the chaos of the battlefield were eventually successful, and modern military drill maneuvers derived directly from this period. The difficulty of keeping men in any kind of order on a battlefield is very great. Most people's instinct is to run away quickly. 
The Spaniards, and then the Dutch and the Swedes, developed a proper drill by which men could train on parade grounds in the techniques and tactics of the battlefields, and thousands of men could maneuver simultaneously. The Thirty Years' War between 1618 and 1648 convulsed Europe and destroyed Germany. It was the culmination of the religious struggles of the 16th century, both the last medieval crusade and, technically, the first modern war. Throughout the 16th century, there were radical developments in siege warfare. These changes involved the virtual redesign of fortified cities in the light of the new threat offered by powerful and plentiful siege guns and accurate and destructive artillery. Initially, it was the Italians who developed star-shaped fortresses so that heavy cannon would no longer face high, thin walls which are easily knocked down. They replaced them with low, fat walls in a star shape to allow the defenders simultaneously to shelter from attack and to fire sideways at attackers and dominate the field of fire. The response was to tunnel under the walls and place mines where they would do most damage. Fortifications had to be extended, with outworks and trenches around the walls to stop enemy tunnels reaching to the heart of the besieged fort. As time went on, ditches and outworks proliferated around the walls of a well-defended fort, as attackers and defenders continuously pitted their wits against one another. An attacker could only capture such elaborate fortifications after a very long siege. Several enormous armies were required to invade and besiege the forts of the enemy, to guard the army's supply lines, and to remain at home in case anyone else attacked. Permanent and standing armies came into use at this time, and although the Dutch were the first into the field, other European powers soon followed. The British emulated the Dutch in many ways. The Dutch had deposed their Spanish king, Philip II, but the British went one better and executed their king, Charles I, in 1649. The result of this, curiously enough, was to strengthen the power of the state. The English monarchy was restored in 1660 and has survived ever since. By 1700, the British had the second largest army, the largest navy, and the second highest taxes in Europe. Many of the uniforms and procedures of the British Army in the present day stem from that period. In particular, these manoeuvres, forming columns and squares, moving together with discipline as these soldiers would be able to under fire, derived directly from military developments during the 16th and 17th centuries. Martin Luther, a German monk, began the religious revolution in 1519, when he attacked the authority of the papacy. Printing presses transmitted his message, in vernacular languages, to every corner of the Christian world. At the Diet of Worms in 1521, Luther refused absolutely to recant. The Pope, Leo X, found that Luther's cause attracted enormous support. The Catholic Church was attacked from all sides, both by Luther and by other heretics and reformers. This eventually brought about a keen debate about the nature of the Church and its reorganization on more dynamic and aggressive lines to combat Protestantism. The massacre of French Protestants on St. Bartholomew's Day in Paris, seen here in a contemporary illustration, was just one of the many horrors perpetrated in the name of religion during the 16th and 17th centuries. As the Christians quarreled, old Europe was transformed. Catholic Europe was permanently divided by a tangle of religious boundaries. Lutheranism developed first and was followed by Calvinism and Anglicanism. 
By 1560, this was the religious map of Europe, with Protestants and Catholics still disputing Central Europe. After the Thirty Years' War, the power of the Catholic Church had been significantly and permanently reduced. Religious wars and the religious stalemate brought many people in the later 16th century to wonder if God really existed. If he did exist, was he on one side or the other, a Protestant or a Catholic? Or perhaps almost inconceivably, there was no revealed truth and reality was only to be found within the scope of human perception. After the 16th and 17th centuries, religious warfare died away in Europe. But the Roman Catholic Mass, in Latin, and the religious feelings that it represents have survived into our own century. The Catholic Church, despite many weaknesses, survived the Reformation and its aftermath. It flourishes today in a form which Luther might still recognize, presenting and expounding the ideas about transubstantiation and the nature of God and religious authority which Luther and others challenged. When America sends space probes into the heavens to examine Venus and photograph Jupiter, the work that NASA does stems directly from calculations and observations by the astronomers and scientists of the 16th and 17th centuries. In 1500, most people believed that the world was flat and there was no accurate knowledge of its geography or of how the planets and the Earth related. The Ptolemaic concept of the universe was that the Earth was stable at the center with the planets and the sun revolving around it. Between 1575 and 1595, the patient and precise observations of the Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe started to provide accurate evidence about the aspects and orbits of the planets. Isaac Newton, the father of physics and the discoverer of gravity, built on that basis, and he and the brilliant young Polish astronomer Copernicus mastered astronomy's mathematical and scientific problems with the help of the calculus developed by the Scotsman John Napier. By the end of the 16th century, it was possible to be sure that the planets orbited the sun, and a disciple of Copernicus, Giordano Bruno, was burned at the stake for professing it. 100 years later, it was possible to observe the planets with powerful telescopes and both to calculate and observe the orbits they followed and their relative speeds. If there is a single date on which we can base the foundation of the modern world, it is the 1st of January, 1600. That was the day on which Johannes Kepler arrived at the Astronomical Laboratory in Prague. Kepler was summoned to help with magical calculations for astrological purposes. But after years of study, he calculated and confirmed the elliptical paths which the planets are now known to follow. European skill in theoretical astronomy, allied to practical skills in technology, caused her increasingly to dominate the globe. More and more since the 16th and 17th centuries, the other continents have become satellites of Europe and the West. <laughs>